Um, so welcome everybody to the Hearsing School of Biomedical Innovation and Entrepreneurship AI rounds. Um, we're very excited to, to have the rounds today. Uh, the goal of the rounds uh, is to bring to the forefront projects and initiatives that are leveraging AI to help solve biomedical problems. Um, today's talk in particular will not be purely research-based, but rather will emphasize AI and healthcare innovation towards commercial success, um, falling under the kind of broader interest of the Hearsing School. And today we have with us uh, Damon Burrow. Damon is a PhD candidate at Duke University in the Pratt School of Engineering in the Biomedical Engineering Department, focused on building point of care biosensing platforms to improve global health. Beyond his PhD work, Damon is also a co-founder of two artificial intelligence companies, Scholar AI and Golf EQ, and a lead life science associate at Duke Capital Partners. Um, without further ado, uh, Damon, welcome, and I look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, everyone, so much for having me. I appreciate everybody being here. I'm really eager and excited to be telling you all about what's going on at Scholar AI, how we're kind of thinking about um, the nascent world that is AI, especially as it pertains to science and research and the ways in which we are thinking about building thoughtful systems so that people like yourselves can do more of what they love. So I'm going to um, share a screen here real fast. And um, can I get a thumbs up from somebody, please, to make sure we are seeing this? Okay, thank you. Okay, so like I said, we are uh, Scholar AI, and what we believe that we are building a piece of is science in the age of AI. And um, so today, I I'm going to be kind of taking several steps through AI, through Scholar AI, and then kind of discussing at the very end um, in the ways that we are kind of thinking about what's coming next. So. Um, before I jump in a little bit about myself, um, as you all heard recently, um, I, I am a PhD student at Duke University. I've been in the artificial intelligence and machine learning space for um, around eight years now. I began some undergraduate work um, helping deliver radiation therapy to uh, cancer patients um, that has since evolved into building technologies that operate at the point of care so we can gather more reliable information, um, specifically as it relates to disease diagnoses. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to make um, educated insights, educated actionable insights um, based on these artificial intelligence systems that we're building. Um, beyond that, uh, you're seeing a picture here of my wife, Bree. Um, she's an advanced practice nurse in the Durham area and our dog, Jax, who is the CEO of our household. And he is with me today. So apologies in advance um, if he tries to inject himself in the conversation. He's, he's usually very good, um, but in the event that that happens, um, I'll just mute for a moment and uh, we'll let that pass. So. Um, I, I've also included on the right side of this screen um, select members of the team at Scholar AI. Um, building these systems is um, very hard. Um, doing so with thoughtfulness and care is, is even harder, and it, it takes um, a lot of really incredibly smart and diligent and hardworking people, and I'm uh, incredibly fortunate to be surrounded by several of those. So um, before I jump in, I, I kind of want to give everyone here a brief perspective on how we got here and with specific regards of how we've evolved from Alan Turing introducing the idea of artificial intelligence in the 1940s and 50s, all the way to chat GPT um, today. So I won't walk you through each one of these steps. I will make these slides available to everyone here um, after this talk. And there are some hyperlinks in here um, that do a much better job of elaborating on each one of these steps um, than we kind of have time for. Here today, but uh, the, the takeaway from this slide is while the public consciousness is somewhat awakening to these systems right now, um, people have been thinking very deeply about how we use advanced intelligent uh, systems that are artificial in nature to help us do the work that ultimately needs to be done. So also before really launching into this talk, I wanted to outline select acronyms that you will see through various parts of this slide. And that way, in case you don't come into this talk with a primer on artificial intelligence uh, and otherwise, we, we can all be communicating with the same language. So just to begin, AI just simply refers to artificial intelligence. LLMs, which is a relatively new acronym, uh, stands for large language models. GPTs stand for generative pre-trained pre transformers. RAG is, stands for retrieval augmented generation. We'll go into detail a little bit yeah. on that later on. ML is machine learning, DL, deep learning, DB for database, and GPU for graphics processing units. And I will say, I don't know um, what the format of this talk typically is, but I'm very happy to take questions 
in the middle of this. So if at any time um, anyone wants to in, uh, interject, I'm more than happy to, to kind of sidebar for a moment if, if helpful. So uh, generative AI specifically is defined as any artificial intelligence um, or any system that creates new content and data. And so the thing that you will be most familiar with is likely uh, ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is not the only form of generative AI. There, there are many others, uh, Google's Bard as another example. Um, there are also non-commercial applications that people have been working on for several years. Um, I mentioned that generative AI has entered the public consciousness, not only uh, at the broader public, but also specifically the scientific communities, both in research and in healthcare practice. And we've seen ChatGPT was named one of uh, nature's kind of most important advancements this year, most important scientists as the first non-human to be uh, featured in that list. And there has been lots of dialogue surrounding the positives and the potential negatives of ChatGPT within science. So launching on that, I want to share a brief story with you about the genesis of Scholar AI and why we kind of went head down into building some of these systems. So ChatGPT was, became publicly available roughly one year ago in November of 2022. At that time, people were using it for various uh, applications. Um, and as a researcher at Duke University, I was very interested to see if this could help me understand scientific documents, if maybe it could help me find scientific documents and um, what the advantages might be there. So myself and two of our other co-founders at Scholar AI were on a video call in which we were playing with ChatGPT, asking it about various topics in science and asking it to produce references for those topics. It was doing so in what we thought was a, a fairly profound and, and quite surprising um, way. What we then did is we followed up through those references to see where those uh, articles had been published. And lo and behold, those publish those articles, uh, the citations that ChatGPT was producing were, were entirely fake. So these systems work, generally speaking, as probability machines that are simply predicting the next word um, based on the prompt that you infuse to it. So it was making up titles, it was making up authors, it was making up DOIs for papers that simply didn't exist. And so you can imagine why this was such an alarming uh, problem for us and why we wanted to set out to fix this. One of the ways in which you can fix this is um, by using a system that is called RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation. And specifically, RAG overcomes some of the inherent limitations of these large language models, specifically the knowledge cutoff and the context windows. And sidebarring for just a moment, the knowledge cutoff refers to the date at which the training of these models end. So let's, let's say that we train a model up all the way through the end of 2023, so basically to present day, but then a new paper comes out tomorrow or next month or next year sometime, that large language model will have never seen that information and can therefore not update its knowledge, quote unquote, to include that additional context. And so by using RAG, we can actually infuse up-to-date information into these large language models. Context windows are slightly different. Context windows actually refer to the working memory of these large language models, meaning how much information in a single large language model um, remember, so to speak. It, sorry. Sorry, that is that is Jax, as I was mentioning. Um, so jumping back into it, the context window is the uh, short-term memory, if you will, of these large language models and how much information they can remember. Anything beyond the context window, that is when you start to see uh, this, this hallucination problem that you may have heard of really starting to pop up. So um, this kind of image here just outlines the difference in a large language model infused with and without RAG. So in the lower half of this image, we're seeing a prompt that goes in. That prompt includes the context of whatever is being asked. It gets passed yeah. to the large language model. The result is uh, created. Instead, when you use RAG, that prompt in context goes out. It includes information that are pulled directly from documents. Uh, those documents are often embedded into vector forms, so basically transforming the words into numbers such that the large language model can actually um, interact with those systems thoughtfully. And so this is exactly what we've built at Scholar AI. We've, we've done some more things um, in addition to just the RAG, and I'll, I'll go through those a little bit later. So what do we get? Basically, before Scholar AI, as I said, you get uh, AI-generated responses that only include generalized information inside of that knowledge base. So 
predating the knowledge cutoff window, and you get no links to the reference material because there is no reference material. These are just um, probabilistic outputs that come from the, con uh, the context of the given prompt. With Scholar AI, what you get is you get more relevant information for your prompt because of increased context awareness. You get accurate information because the information is pulled directly from reliable sources, such as textbooks or peer-reviewed articles, and you get links directly to those sources. And I, I picked a select um, paper uh, showing kind of the advantages of the combination of the techniques that Scholar AI has, has built. And specifically, those techniques include prompt engineering, precision retrieval, augmented generation, and the creation of AI native data sets. In the future, it will also include uh, science first, large language model um, fine tuning. And what these uh, researchers did is they fed in the different um, images of, uh, in, the, in this case, scoliosis, um, patients with or without scoliosis or with uh, varying severities of scoliosis. And on the, the right over here, what I'm showing is the difference between uh, ChatGPT4, which is ChatGPT using the GPT-4 model, um, ChatGPT-4 with Bing. So just the ability to kind of go out and browse all the information across the internet, um, Scholar AI in the free version and then Scholar AI in the premium version. And of note, um, you can see that Scholar AI Premium um, actually performed as well as ChatGPT4 and even, even better in most cases and better than um, uh, the model when equipped with Bing uh, browsing. And, and it might be curious to some of you in the audience as to why ChatGPT4 with Bing might underperform ChatGPT4 without Bing. And this gets at the idea of the information that exists across the internet, as many of you will likely into it, isn't reliable. Some of it is very reliable. Some of it is misleading or um, intentionally uh, incorrect. And because the large language model is given access to the entirety of the internet, it has a difficulty parsing what are the most relevant and most credible sources, um, kind of away from the remaining um, articles that, that aren't as helpful. Um, so said another way, um, if you just give large language models unfettered access to the internet, they have a hard time by themselves separating signal from the noise. And so you need to be thoughtful about these systems. And we believe that in order to be truly useful for scientists and researchers, we need to take a science first approach. And so that's what we have done. And what, that's what we believe we are doing at Scholar AI. So right now I'm going to break from this talk a little bit, and I'm going to instead show you uh, a demo. I'm going to take you through a couple of ways in which I'm using uh, Scholar AI in my day to day, um, some of the ways in which you might, and then also kind of extend that thought to ways in which this technology might translate to uh, the broader public. So um, for those of you not initiated with ChatGPT, this is what kind of the current interface looks like. So you have your standard ChatGPT in your sidebar over here. Um, I, let me take one step back. This, this is actually only available to ChatGPT Plus subscribers. So if you are not a ChatGPT Plus subscriber, which recently uh, reopened, um, then you won't have access to this. You will just have access to the um, the basic ChatGPT running the uh, GPT 3.5 model. But assuming that you are a Plus subscriber uh, and assuming that you do have access to these tools, this is kind of what your interface might look like. So what you're looking at over here is a sidebar that include the various GPTs, um, a couple of them that I've built for other applications. You can see my Golf EQ one here, my um, chat DCP, which I made for uh, Duke Capital Partners to help us kind of source and evaluate um, deals in, in, in kind of the VC world. Scholar AI, which I will get to in a moment, and then ChatGPT is kind of your vanilla ChatGPT. Here is where we can actually enable plugins, um, including Scholar AI, and we can search on this plugin store for Scholar AI. And so Scholar AI is often positioned next to other brands you would have likely heard of, such as Wikipedia, Wolfram Alpha, uh, Zapier, et cetera. So we simply click install, and then we have Scholar AI ready to go. And then natively inside of ChatGPT, whenever is appropriate, Scholar AI will, will kind of be your helpful research assistant. So that is where we are. We encourage people not to use uh, the Scholar AI plugin in favor of the GPT. But if you prefer the plugin, then by all means, you're going to get all the same advantages. Uh, you just have to deal with a little bit of extra um, optimization that you wouldn't have to do inside of the GPT. So for this time, I'm going to show you the GPT, uh, but just realize that a lot of the same things you're seeing in the GPT are also available to you in the plugins should you choose to use it in, in that manner. I will say the counter argument to that is that if your workflow is used to uh, combining 
the advantages of multiple plugins, such as Scholar AI and maybe showing diagrams in which you're taking scientific concepts and transforming them into illustrated kind of uh, diagrammatic uh, schemas, then that is where um, kind of branching these plugins together may be advantageous and where you might opt for the plugin over the over the GPT. But leaving that for the time being, let's hop over into the GPT and I will show you some common use cases. So in the GPT, uh, what you're seeing here is Scholar AI, and this is a, is a research assistant. Basically, inside of our corpus, uh, we have transformed a little over 200 million articles, journals, and books into what we believe is a more AI native and AI usable uh, data set. And we continue to do, uh, we, we continue to build systems that we believe are improving that process kind of all the time. So, so uh, down here, we have some uh, recommended prompts that allow us to step through some of the very uh, kind of common use cases. So basically finding papers, uh, examining the experimental procedures, papers relevant to basically generating a literature map over a single paper, um, getting access to the papers that have cited it, papers are cited in that paper, et cetera, and then ultimately exporting references to Zotero reference managers. Uh, we do have more integrations for reference managers upcoming, but we also have some, some features in the dedicated web app, which I will uh, be outlining a little bit in detail later on that I think will improve your experience with the overall reference manager uh, kind of tools that you may have, that may, you may be used to experimenting with. So hopping in here, I'm going to ask Scholar AI to find me three papers about artificial intelligence. And so what you'll see populating in real time here is Scholar AI using the large language model. So this, the starting action is essentially that prompt being fed into Scholar AI system. Scholar AI is digesting that prompt. It's understanding the context of that prompt. It's going to then pass that to the large language model, allow the large language model to go and access the corpus of over 200 million uh, articles that I referenced earlier, find the ones that are most relevant, or at least um, you know what it believes are the most relevant, and it's going to return those to us in a list. And so because I asked for three, it's going to return three. We're not limited to three. Um, however, just for the sake of time, I, I, I told it to find three here. And so what you're seeing populate is the, the title of the paper, um, either the entire abstract or a, a brief snippet of it, depending on the length of the abstract, uh, author's publication date, how many people have cited it, and the DOI. Again, our, our goal here is to show people not only the information, but where that information came from so that they can follow up and ensure that anything coming out of these responses are um, accurate and, and ultimately actionable. And so we'll, we'll wait as this kind of uh, finishes, and then I will, I'll kind of click out to one of these just to, just to confirm that it did in fact find the, uh, the proper paper. And then uh, we'll move on to our kind of our, our, our next use case. So um, the reason that this takes a while, uh, truthfully, is, is again, this, this large language model that is out crawling the internet um, is, is bringing back results. So it does take a little bit of time for it to parse through all the possible options and bring back the, the kind of one that we, uh, that we need most. So uh, this, this paper number three uh, seems, seems fairly interesting to me. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm, I'm going to follow up with Scholar AI and say, um, provide a summary of paper three. And what you're going to do, uh, what you're going to see now is a couple different options. If Scholar AI has access to the entirety of the full text of this article, meaning that this article exists in the open access domain, it's not tucked behind a paywall established by the publisher, then Scholar AI is going to be able to parse every single page of that document and it's going to be able to pull back uh, a synthesis of the information. What we're actually seeing here is this error talking to, which what that means essentially is that this paper, for one reason or another, is locked behind a paywall. And so I'm going to go ahead and go investigate this and see what's going on here. But it looks like this, uh, so this paper, this publisher rather has kind of locked this down. And so that's okay. Um, we, we don't have access to all of the papers in, in the um, private domain simply because these journals want to, uh, you know, kind of protect their assets, which is, which is reasonable. Um, you know, we, we can have the debate on open access versus closed access, um, it, it, you know, at, at a different time. But the key takeaway here is that while we can find the paper, if you have institutional access, like through Duke University, through McMaster, et cetera, um, then we will be able to grab this paper, download it as a PDF, and then re-upload to Scholar AI. And so I'm going to take you into what that would look like uh, alternatively. So um, I'll share a, a bit of a story that's kind of near and dear to my heart. My, my mother was recently, or uh, I guess roughly three years ago, uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. And while, um, you know, Obviously, in the sciences, that is not something that I am incredibly knowledgeable about. So I like to stay apprised with some of the kind of burgeoning research in that area. 
And um, recently there was some new work that came out of a clinical trial, uh, phase one study specifically out of California. And so this is just me uh, downloading that PDF and then simply asking Scholar AI to take a look through this PDF such that I can kind of understand the, the information that's coming out of there. So basically uh, this is a summary of a paper that introduced a potential vaccine for um, triple negative uh, breast cancer. And basically um, it provides an, an overview, trial participants, results, dose levels, future plans, uh, the, the mechanism, its significance, et cetera, et cetera. And I will uh, just for sake of uh, demonstration today show you kind of what that looks like. So essentially come in here. Um, if you upload anything that you have actually downloaded like this, uh, you simply just push open or better you upload it to um, ChatGPT using the Scholar AI GPT. And then we can send this thing in. And then again, Scholar AI uh, instructs the large language model to go and uh, read this PDF um, in a way that is uh, systematic, such that it doesn't actually hallucinate or create any of these kind of misleading or otherwise kind of uh, factual uh, analyses. So uh, I, th this is, this will be the exact same output or, or relatively speaking, uh, very close to the exact same output as what we're seeing here. So I won't wait on that one to finish. Instead, what I will do is I will uh, jump over into here and rather than kind of walking you through this demo, I'll kind of take you uh, a little bit through a use case of how I'm using this system in my day to day for my actual research. So in the lab, I work on a group of technologies that can commonly be referred to as passive microfluidic devices. Essentially, how do you control liquids, uh, specifically whole blood samples, such that we can run uh, biochemical analyses, point of care diagnostic tests uh, outside of traditional hospital infrastructure. So the most common example that uh, many people are familiar with are glucose tests that usually diabetic patients use to help control their sugar levels. Alternatively, during the recent pandemic, we all became intimately familiar with COVID lateral flow assays that you would get at uh, Walgreens, CVS, or, or, or whatever the equivalent uh, might be um, in, in your area. So I ask uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis for Scholar AI to find me uh, papers that are using emerging methods in, in these fields. So whether it be passive microfluidic devices, whether it be um, new detection methods, uh, new signal reporters, et cetera. Um, what I'm asking you to do is, is find these papers, um, parse the abstracts, present information to me so that I know which of these papers are best for me to read. And I hope that some of you in the audience have some hesitation around the injection of a lot of these tools in a researcher's day to day. And what I mean by that specifically is we don't want to be building systems that takes the responsibility out of the researcher's hands. We want to be building systems that enable the researcher to do more. And saying that a different way, this system has enabled me, instead of reading 10 papers that have been somewhat randomly selected by my kind of general searching of the internet using a Google Scholar of PubMed of, of any other online database, this system enables me to quickly filter through hundreds or even thousands of papers and identify the 10 highest impact or the 10 most important for my work and then spend my time reading these. So it has really focused my efforts, enabling me to do more without, I would argue, diluting uh, the information that I'm ultimately getting. So um, emphasizing that and, and, and saying, kind of building on it, these, these are tools meant to amplify and enable people to do more with their time specifically doing the things that they enjoy or the things that are the highest value to them rather than spending time uh, doing kind of the other parts of their maybe day-to-day -day that kind of are mundane or that can be um, kind of offloaded to these kind of more automated uh, systems. So um, I'm gonna leave the demo. I'm gonna hop back into the deck. Uh, we got a few more slides here and then I hope we have, yeah, we're doing good on time. So we've got quite a bit of time left for some Q and A. So, um, all right. So where, where are we? Where are we kind of in this timeline? Um, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, it, we believe the AI kind of industry at large is incredibly nascent. It shifts on a day-to-day. -day. It kind of changes and, and uh, moves out from under us kind of all the time. And so right now we feel very strongly that information sourcing, specifically using these large language models to go out and find papers, find articles, that kind of thing is is well within the capacity of these current systems, especially as it comes from the scientific literature as we just showed. And we can also do synthesis 
on that information. So we can not just pull information from a single paper, but we can begin to aggregate information across many papers and present that in a way that is digestible um, for, for, for human researchers or, or scientists. We believe the next step of that is using that information, specifically that synthesis piece, to be able to establish what needs to be asked and what important questions need to be answered on what we believe is a scientific frontier. And the way that that kind of crystallizes is into hypothesis creation and the defining of critical research questions. So again, sharing an anecdotal story with you as a incoming PhD student, one of my first tasks was in understanding the broad literature in the field that I were studying and defining some critical research questions uh, that ultimately need to be answered such that I could begin planning on and hoping to build technologies to overcome some of the, uh, of the problems and challenges that existed. The next step after those hypotheses have been created and we've defined what critical research questions uh, need to be answered, we can then begin to plan experiments. So we believe that AI can assist in this capacity. We also believe that AI can act as a conduit to connect people um, in order to get the expertise to the right areas and connect that expertise with labs or um, different facilities capable of actually performing the experiments so that we can gather data. The last step is, of course, the data analysis, paper and patent publication, uh, review, et cetera. And so I don't pretend to know the timeline of these things. I think it would be irresponsible to, to guess on how long we think this will take. But uh, we do believe that um, you know, with some confidence that these are the steps that we can anticipate for AI being kind of helpful throughout the scientific process um, you know, in, in the short or near term, I, I think we'll be open for discussion. So kind of harkening back to the last slide, what are we building at Scholar AI and, and kind of how are we doing this? Uh, as I said, the, the next thing for us at Scholar AI is, is to help define or derive those research questions at the frontier of knowledge. So what exists in a field, what gap need to be filled and how do we help facilitate uh, the work of those experts such that they can actually act on those things. We also believe we can help to identify the funding opportunities and collaborators once we know which questions are important to ask, we believe that we'll be able to build a network and help people connect with those who are capable of uh, pursuing those ideas in, in the proper ways. Uh, again, we believe we can help plan those experiments. We believe that we can help analyze those results. We believe that ultimately culminates in grants, papers, and patents that hopefully uh, lead to more scientific innovations. And we believe as a final stage, we can do editing and review. So in conclusion, um, we believe that science touches everyone, and we also believe that AI is set to be uh, one of, if not the biggest productivity amplifier in, in human history. And I'll, I'll share a little bit, just a brief highlight here of where Scholar AI is today, um, and, and kind of to, to emphasize or to, to underscore uh, those ideals. And so thus far, like I said, we've built this corpus of over 200 million um, papers, textbooks, et cetera. Uh, we've, we've been used over 30 million times since inception, and inception was roughly uh, June uh, of this year, so, you know, in, in not so many months. Um, we have so far been used by over 294,000 people, and uh, Scholar AI systems have been featured in, um, the last time I checked, it was uh, roughly 15 um, peer-reviewed publications. So um, our, our core technology is, is built for science, scientists and researchers specifically, but uh, as you might imagine, that circle quickly broadens when you think about how many people uh, use the or interact with the, the scientific literature. So that includes physician scientists, physicians that are seeing patients, uh, nurses, business analysts, patent lawyers, journalists, uh, consultants, especially those in the life sciences, and students in the STEM sciences, humanities, uh, and beyond. And so the analogy that I would share with you, and if you're wondering when you might use Scholar AI over some other system, uh, the thought I would encourage you to hold on to is anytime that you would go to Google and you would use standard Google, that is not something in which Scholar AI is going to be the highest impact. Or anytime that search feels like it's more specific to Google Scholar or PubMed, that is when I would encourage you to be using Scholar AI. And so with that, I will pause. I've got some appendix slides if helpful to, to help answer some questions or drive the conversations in different directions, but would love to take a beat here and then uh, leave, yeah, uh, a good amount of time for question and answering. So I hope, I hope that was helpful. I hope it was informative and I appreciate all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present to you today.
I can, uh, I have like so many questions. That was really fascinating. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I do. So I'm a radiologist. I do a lot of um, diagnostic accuracy, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And right away, I'm just thinking like, wouldn't it be amazing if you could use an application like this to identify your studies, um, you know, to include, you know, if you were to, for example, provide specific criteria, um, it would be really cool if you could even take it to the next level one day and actually say, you know, here, we're going to pull out the relevant data that you're looking for, for your meta-analysis um, and, and do a bias assessment. And I, I mean, those are sort of higher level things, but, um, you know, I totally see something like this as the building blocks for that down the road. Uh, so I commend you, like, th this is really great. Um, you know, one of the things I've wondered about um, is just, you know, sometimes trying to come up with a good clinical research question that, that's actually feasible to do with what we have is a challenge. Um, and so I, I actually I haven't tried it with chat GPT or the other kind of large language models that are out there. But um, have you played around with coming up with kind of new novel research questions, you know, out of the box? So, you know, maybe, you know, for example, at Hamilton Health Sciences, we have a lot of pancreas cancer patients. Um, if I were to say, you know, we have you know, we do a lot of pancreatectomies. We have these types of patients. Uh, these are some of the big questions in pancreas cancer. What would be a good research question? Have you have you tried that at all? And, and uh, just just wondering if if you've had any success in that area. Yeah. So first off, thanks thanks for the comments and and uh, kind of uh, questions. Uh, one comment very quickly to the idea of the meta analysis and the systematic reviews. Um, it's 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 the absolute right point. And in fact, we've launched. Um, two specific projects currently to, to do exactly that and um, defining the benchmarks of what actually comes out of that is a is a fairly elaborate process and we're working with md phd groups at two different universities to help us do that and make sure that we aren't the only ones kind of saying whether it is successful or or not so just just saying um your intuition's in the exact right place and uh we are we are working on it and we we agree that it's kind of the next step and then so that that leads directly into thoughts on the second part of your comments and questions which is hypothesis creation, how do you kind of, again, understand which critical research questions to ask? And then not only that, but what does the Venn diagram look like of important research questions combined with what we're actually capable of doing, given the limitations of our time, our resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we actually see that process somewhat sequentially, meaning that if we do prove that we are able to reliably and thoughtfully create those meta-analyses, that's actually how we define the missing links or the gaps, if you will, that help define those critical research questions. And the second part of it, how you connect research questions with labs or experts or people capable of answering those and answering those in, in kind of the, the most effective ways, um, that is probably something that in time AI will help with, but in the meantime, we'll probably be a network of humans uh, kind of manually outreaching to the to the right experts and coordinating that way. So again, we see a sequential process of having AI help us find insights. In the first step, then those insights get transformed into actions via human intervention. And then as we progress, as these AI systems get better, AI can help us kind of go from actions to insights in more in more thoughtful and, and complete ways. So hope that hope that kind of answered your question. But we 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 see everything that you're kind of outlining as as a, as a sequential process while keeping trust and transparency core to everything that we're doing. And so you know with that comes some what we believe are, are important uh stepwise processes to to progress through. Totally. And one one thing you could do and you may be doing this now, but you could take existing systematic reviews and, and just, you know, look at what studies they included based on their criteria and, and use that as a ground truth. And I imagine it may not be the perfect ground truth, but it would probably be a good starting point. But anyways, that's it for me. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we think that again, speaking back just the benchmarks, we we think that some sort of confusion matrix or confusion matrix type analysis is exactly what we'll have to do, right? How much of the information coming out of our system is accurate. And then uh, secondarily to that, how much of the uh, highest priority information that could have been included was included by our, our system. So lots of lots of work to do, but again, your ideas and your intuition isn't, isn't exactly uh, the right place. So um, Shania, I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a hand there. Is there something? Yeah, great presentation. I know uh, you focused on um, how Scholar A can be applicable, especially in the context of like the health sciences. And I'm just curious for, individuals outside of the science world, um, how how user-friendly is the tool um, in terms of capturing information and 
potential research papers in different fields. And then for the entrepreneurs or the founders in, in this call, um, thinking about patent searching and I guess different utility options for Scholar AI. Yeah, you no, know, it's, it's, it's a fantastic question. I'll take the patents first and then I'll go back to user friendliness and kind of speak at the larger point of large language models in general. So if you go back to kind of the, the, the use cases of our tool right now, some, somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of all the people using Scholar AI are whom I would call scientists and or researchers. These are people that are trying to define research questions, they're planning experiments, they're testing hypotheses, they're writing up results. The other, you know, roughly 30 to 40 percent are all these other people you'll see here, physicians, nurses, analysts, students, patent lawyers, like you said. The next progression of Scholar AI is to include more and more in our databases. So we want to go beyond papers and textbooks. We want to include patents, uh, those kind of things. There, there is a little bit of a risk there. And again, I'll, I'll show uh, this slide to highlight that, is that every time you add a database to uh, that is kind of searchable by these large language models, that must be done with care. Otherwise, you run the risk of them being somewhat inundated with uh, information that's not relevant to the prompts. And then you get, you get a diminished quality of answers as you're seeing um, right here. So Bing, in theory, has access to Google Scholar. It has access to PubMed. So it has access to all of the baseline information that Scholar AI systems have been built on, yet it's underperforming Scholar AI. And the reason is context awareness, right? We, we've kind of spe specified to these things. And so as we expand to patents, as we expand to clinical trial databases, we, again, we have to do so, so thoughtfully and make sure that whatever prompts we're being asked to uh, help with, uh, we're doing so effectively and with high levels of, of accuracy. Um, and then so that kind of wraps a bow on the, the patent law uh, or the patent um, question. The question of usability, user friendliness uh, beyond kind of engineers, beyond STEM sciences, beyond those kind of things um, is it, something that uh, I will speak speak on a little bit just in the context of large language models. So the, the beauty, the impact, the importance, the kind of significant strides of the large language models is how incredibly intuitive it is simply for humans to be able to talk to things or to type to things. And so every time the large language model, uh, currently the large language model powering Scholar AI is the GPT-4 uh, transformer from OpenAI, but we're in no ways beholden to that one we can use whichever large language model is, is best. And as a result of that, we get um, access to all of the languages that can be understood by GPT-4, all of the countries that can use ChatGPT. And so we, we find um, a, a large fraction of users who don't speak English and who, who you know, have never learned English. Or um, you can very easily ask Scholar AI to do something like translate a scientific article to the conversational level of a five-year-old or a fifth grader or whatever. And so um, it is, it is uh, our goal to, to infuse trust in these large language models and allow the things that the large language models are great at, specifically in this case, user friendliness, um, really shine in, in, in that context. So, um, is it uh, Tasnia? Is that am I pronouncing that right? Yes, Tasnia. Thank you. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really interesting to learn more about Scholar AI after having used it. Um, I was curious about. A prompt such as, can you find me three papers on artificial intelligence? I feel like that's a pretty broad prompt. So what are the factors that Scholar AI is looking for when generating those three papers? Is it like the top Bing results or is number of citations? And if I were to do it on my computer, would I have a different result than you? All, all great questions. So um, taking it to one, one piece at a time, what, what goes into the prompt? How are those results? prioritize, rank, sort it, and then return, and then we'll take the second question of if you put them into your computer, will they be different, okay? So on, on the very first aspect, how are those done? So the way that we do it right now is very similar to the way that a Google search would do it. So it's based on keywords first, it includes semantic context second, and then it is um, rule-based in that by default, it returns citation counts now and publication year. So it's a cross of citation count and publication year. If you want to, as the user include, in your prompt, um, a specific date range, or by a specific author, or not sort by citation count, that is available to you. But the default right now is some cross of uh, recency and citation count, basically. And then so to the second part, or to your second question, would the results that you put into your computer differ? Yes, 
in the sense that these may, uh, these systems are inherently uh, stochastic, meaning that there's always some probability that the answer it produces for you is different than the answer that it produced for me. But again, if you go back to those defaults, overwhelmingly, there's going to be great overlap there with the same uh, prompt, but that you can't guarantee with 100% certainty that they're going to be the same. So. Thank you. That was really interesting. Yeah, and to just building on that slightly, um, right now, again, we exist as a ChatGPT plugin and we exist as a GPT inside of the ChatGPT ecosystem. Our upcoming web app that is going to be released in the new year allows us to do a lot more with user customization, such that each of the models that you will have, or sorry, each, each of the models that we will have will ultimately be more tailored to your specific use cases as an individual user. So our models will get better for you over time as you manage different projects, different uh, conversations, different queries inside of um, Scholar AI. So we're very excited about the amount of um, personalizability we'll be able to deliver to users outside of the chat GPT ecosystem. And again, those will, those will be available in, you know, optimistically one month's time. Um, but again, we, we, we have to make sure that anytime we release something, it's, it's better than, than what we kind of already have. And so just kind of, you know, uh, keep your eyes out for that and we'll, we'll be communicative about when that's going to be available to everybody. Um, so would that be like a personalized kind of GPT for suppose if I'm doing research on microfluidic devices, it would give me everything that I need for this specific topic? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So um, it's not, it, it's not technically true to call it a specific GPT. Um, it would be um, a version of a fine tuned large language model that would be fine tuned over our academic corpus. And then for your specific projects, what it actually is able to do is it go, it can go beyond a single prompt, but it, when you begin to manage it in uh, multiple conversations, multiple prompts under a specific project umbrella, it can, it can synthesize the context across all of those such that it can kind of go out and become slightly more and hopefully eventually completely proactive in that regard. So it, it's not quite a, 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 you know, an individual or personal GPT, but what it is, is it has increased context awareness for your specific use cases that makes it hopefully better and more actionable for the things that you're ultimately looking for. I'm excited for that release. Yeah, we're excited. We're very excited because um, uh, like, as I said, as a as a user myself, there are ways in which we know these systems can be better. And a lot of the reasons why we've been bottlenecked so far have to do with um, simply uh, being inside the, the walled garden that is ChatGPT. Again, there's there's advantages to being there. Um, so that's definitely not a detriment, but there's just other possibilities that exist outside of that that we're really looking forward and really excited about taking advantage of. Um, Hannah. Yeah, so I just had a question. So I know that there are different people that could range like all over the spectrum on kind of their education and how much they've used AI or chat GPT specifically. I was just wondering, like, I know that there were those four sample prompts that you showed when you did the demo, the demo of the GPT, but like, are there any other resources that people could go to if they don't really know where to start? Like, could they interact with the tool and ask hypothetically, like, I am in pharmacy, what questions could I ask you to get the most value out of your tool? Or do you have like any resources that people could just use to get started, like sample prompts or just anything like that? Yeah, it's, it's great. And I'll, I'll actually just hop out of this um, presentation just so I can kind of it, you know illustrate this with a point. So if you go over to the GPT, um, we, we do have these sample prompts that people can begin with. Um, the other thing that these things are incredibly good at are being conversation agents. So you can ask Scholar AI, Exactly like you said, I'm a pharmacist. How can I best use this tool to help me do X or to help me do Y? In addition to simply speaking to these systems, um, we have various resources available on our website at scholarai.io. Uh, and we also um, do our best job at uh, writing blogs, creating newsletters, um, social media posts, those kind of things, such that wherever people are, they can find, interact with us, and hopefully uh, learn how to best use these tools for, for their use cases. So. Um, we're also uh, a small team and, and we really like speaking to people. And so if, um, if, if ever anyone has questions or, or wants to, they can feel free to reach us at um, info at scholarii.io or um, at my email, which is um, damon at scholarii.io. So excellent question. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Damon. That was fascinating, and it's great to see just the work that you have done and the the real problem you are addressing over with, through scholarly AI. You and your team. I'm actually my question is actually the pre scholarly AI 
uh, space. So what you described, that is a very, very quick turnaround for, for a launch date of uh, really an application within um, the, the chat GPT or the evolution of generative AI that came to kind of the public mind um, only one year ago, you launched this six months ago. Was this like, was the, the genesis of this idea, was this on the eve of the release of, of ChatGPT and a mobilization of that, or was it work before that? You're, I'm just I'm curious about your ability, you and the team you mobilized to be able to, to identify this gap, see the possibility that could exist um, by leveraging AI and then the pathway that took you to a GPT that really could um, have such a, a wonderful uh, kind of use case and also future? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, it, it's a little bit of all of the above. And so, like I said, or, or kind of like I referenced in the, in the beginning, I've been working in research either directly in or related to this space since about 2015. So kind of have been conscious of the field and the advancements uh, coming as a whole. Um, you know, kind of historians, if you take a look back through, they'll, they'll really put a pin in 2017 with the release of the paper titled Attention is All You Need from Google. And so since then, there's kind of been this increasing, uh, you know, proliferation of public consciousness for these things. And that really boiled over uh, last November or so when ChatGPT kind of came onto the scene, right? It was the fastest tool ever to 100 million users. And we've been ideating in this space for a while. And um, again, as I, as I referenced, this is my second uh, artificial intelligence company that I co-founded. The, the previous one was co-founded in um, 2020, uh, kind of peak COVID. Um, and that was using artificial intelligence to help uh, golfers. But what we were waking up to is just these large language models were so much more powerful than a lot of the even machine learning applications that have been applied commercially before. And we knew that as soon as the, the you know, public at large got a hold of these things, they were going to use them because they're just, they're so, they're, they're great at saving time. People, you know, no longer have to draft the first draft of documents. Um, they don't have to, you know, go out and manually search through or sift through all this information. Um, and so we knew people were going to be using them and we, we felt obligated as people able to and, and excited to do so, build systems that enabled those people to do those things without risking their reputation or, you know, revenue in some cases or, or, or harm in the, in the context of trying to use these things to provide uh, medical treatment, right? And so there was a famous, uh, I believe it was New York Times story um, that came out earlier this year of a, of a lawyer that unfortunately used ChatGPT to try to help him construct arguments for a case and the citations that it provided were fake, they were made up. And so there was, you know, a, a massive legal fallout for this person, um, you know, probably that person's reputation and career are damaged forever because they use this system somewhat unknowingly and without the proper safeguards in place. And so we, we just felt um, both excited and uh, somewhat responsible to build uh, safeguards, if you will, around these systems so that people um, in science specifically could use these to amplify their productivity, you know, enabling them to focus on the things that they care most about, hopefully offloading some of the more, you know, administrative or maybe mundane uh, monotonous parts of their work that they maybe aren't in love with, but to do so without the the risk of these things, um, you know, uh, really harming people or be, whether it be themselves or, or people they're trying to ultimately help. So that's great. Thank you. Of course, uh, Shania. Um, my question, as I know we're running low on time now, but what are you most excited to see in the field of AI and its integration in healthcare and health research? Um, as someone who, you know, you have your foot in research and you have your foot as a founder, and so you have a unique positionality to to speak to. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic. I think at the highest level, our ambition for the technology that we're building are to enable scientists to, to do more. And, and the way that that, you know, kind of ultimately manifests, we hope, is it in new scientific innovations. So things that would otherwise not be possible um, being enabled by scholar AI. Um, kind of zooming in on that and speaking about how it affects my day-to-day -day and the things that I have ambition for there is, I know brilliant uh, current former PhD students, professors in academia who are 
dramatically inclined to different parts of the research process. Some love interacting with scientific literature, um, some love planning experiments, some love generating hypotheses, some love actually performing those experiments, some love writing, some love the review, the editing, the critique process. And our hope is that by using Scholar AI and other systems that will also emerge, that people get to spend 90% of their time doing the things they want to do. So if you're, if you're a scientist who wants to spend all their time reading and coming up with new ideas, new hypotheses to be tested, you can do that. And then you can pass those great ideas along to people who are exceptional at executing experiments, gathering data that, that can then be fed to people who want to spend their time uh, crafting narrative articles, uh, publishing those results, et cetera. So, um, you know, saying it as concisely as possible, we want to build tools that transform insights into action and enable people to do more of what they love and less of what they don't like to do without fear of, you know, damaging their reputation, basically. Um, Bosman, Bosman. Hi, Damon. Thank you. Uh, a great presentation. Uh, I have a, a quick technical question. Um, in terms of when you said you, uh, you, you have a RAG implementation and um, you are vectorizing the information, um, so you do a pre-search on the vectorized information. Are you storing just the abstract? Are you vectorizing just the abstract? Or when you, when you get the full corpus of uh, the full text, are you storing the full text um, for that uh, first pass search? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. I'm going to provide just a bit of context um, for what kind of the, the vectorization, um, what that vector embedding might, might look like. And then I'll kind of answer your question just for anybody on the call who's not as familiar with the process that you kind of eloquently outlined there. So uh, vector embedding or the process of embedding largely is simply taking text, transforming that into a, a numerical representation of that text, such that the information, including the context, is preserved and then storing that in a database that can be indexed um, in, a, in a much more kind of a systematic mathematical process compared to just translating the text. Um, and so the the answer to your question, uh, Fosman, and apologies for not pronouncing that perfectly, no. is um, uh, full text whenever we have access to it. So anything that exists in the open access domain, it's full text. Otherwise, it's titles, abstracts, and all the metadata. So in, in, in all cases, it's titles, abstracts, and metadata. In cases in which we have uh, legal access to the open uh, to the full text it includes the full text as well okay uh thank you yeah the the reason i ask is that um especially on institutional level we have access to multiple other data sources um uh, through the institutional level so i was thinking that actually incorporating something like this specifically for a certain institution that means you can actually you can get all the uh um papers that are you have access to and then vectorize it and store it in-house right and then you can go through so you have access to full text yeah yes and no um so that currently has to exist at the user level um and that that's due to legal reasons again oh, okay kind of copyright information around the publishers and so in an ideal world uh we would have access to all of it such that we could pass along those insights um there's a there's discussions to be had around how we are thinking about ways that we can um with full transparency and by uh, respecting everybody's boundaries and who owns the content, um, you do do all of the things that you're that you're saying. But currently, if if you as a user have access to the PDF of that document um, via your institution or otherwise, uh, then you absolutely can upload that information and that knowledge, if you will, to Scholar AI, and we can we can make actionable insights based on that information. We just cannot facilitate the process of handing you that. Um, that that paper yeah. basically, that pdf um because we we can't facilitate your access there that makes sense yeah it makes sense yeah i, I was more thinking of like uh, having an in in-house uh, implementation uh, at a different level so yes. you have access to all papers yeah thank you yep. thank you very much very proud of just got one in the um okay I'm not seeing any more hands, nothing in the chat. Uh, anything else? Thank you, Damon. Uh, I don't see any other hands or questions. Okay. okay. Great, well, yeah, thank you so much. Again, that was really fascinating. 
Um, and really, really appreciate your time today. Um, for, for all the attendees, rounds will be posted on the school's uh, Mac video and YouTube channels. Um, our next rounds are scheduled for Wednesday, January 17th, and uh, I hope to see everybody there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.